I'm Rachel Smith. I'm uh, one of the astrophysicists who works here. I'm also um, in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at App State, and it is a real honor to be able to introduce our astronaut today, Douglas Wheels Wheelock. Which I, That's right. Uh, um, he's an American engineer and astronaut. He's from up, he's from upstate New York. He's flown in space twice, logging 178 days on this space shuttle Discovery, the International Space Station, and he flew on the Russian Soyuz spacecraft. And his NASA experience includes four contingency spacewalks, which I'm sure he'll tell us about, more, one to repair a torn solar array, array and three to repair a critical cooling system on board, on board the Soyuz. And, and it all sounds really exciting. And um, we're so happy you're here to hear, uh, listen to his super amazing talk, I'm sure. And he's won a, a, a ton of awards, which I won't even tell you about. But um, thank you. We thank, thank him you. so much for coming at awesome. la and thank you. last minute. So thanks a lot. And thank you, guys. Thank you. So um, is this a little too loud? Is that? Avid, okay, it's good. So my name is Doug. Everybody at NASA calls me Wheels. Um, I wish it was because I drove a cool car or something, but uh, or was a fast runner. But my last name is Wheelock, so so it's not very original. So I was nicknamed Wheels way back in elementary school. Actually, grew up in a small town in upstate New York, uh, the town of Windsor. Anybody know where Windsor, New York, is? Anybody know where Binghamton, New York is? Bingo town, we call it now. Bing okay, if you know where Binghamton is, that's where I was born. And I grew up east of there on the west side of the Catskills. Uh, but just an ordinary kid from an ordinary place. And so today I'm going to talk to you about the things I want you to take out of here. First, at the very end, we're going to have a science test, okay? So, so get ready for your exam. Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> we're going to relax. If you want to take a science test, we'll... So I'm going to show you some cool pictures, some cool video, and stuff like that, and talk to you about, about space, what it's like to live and work in space, kind of some of the scary moments and some of the moments of euphoria uh, that you experience in space. And, but I, what I really want to talk to you about, I'm kind of aiming this uh, to the younger children in the room, and those of you who are parents that are with those children or teachers, um, how we can encourage our children to realize their dreams as well. Because I grew up as an ordinary kid from an ordinary place. And when I got to NASA, I felt like I did not belong. And um, one of the very first people, I, I was selected in uh, 1998 as an astronaut. So 20 years I've been an astronaut. And when I got there, my knees were kind of rattling together because I was in the hallowed halls of NASA. And um, because I had all these, all these heroes when I was a kid growing up. And I was a wee little boy when we put people on the moon and watched them walking around on the moon. I thought, that's pretty cool. You know, and every little kid at that time, everybody with a beating heart wanted to be an astronaut, you know, walk on the moon because we saw people, we saw a human boot, boot print and we saw a human face on the moon and we thought, that's crazy. And I remember I went into my my next, I was in elementary school. Of course, that happened in July, and so it was during, during the summer break. And when I went back to school that fall, uh, I had a teacher. Her name was Christine West, and uh, it was her first year teaching. It was a very small school, CR Weeks Elementary School in West Windsor, New York. Windsor is a very small town, and I went to school in West Windsor, which is even smaller, of course. And, uh, and so I remember coming to school um, that, that fall, and she said, like, wasn't it amazing? Did you see the people walking on the moon? I thought, man, that's really cool. She goes, you know, you could do that too. And I thought, this woman is crazy. You know, and I'm thinking, and I'm thinking like, she must, they must have sent her here because they paid for her school. It's like, you got to go to this little country school with these ordinary kids in this ordinary town and uh, talk to these kids about dreaming, not realizing that years later, when I got to NASA, one of the really cool things at NASA when you're, when you're first selected as an astronaut, we have an astronaut reunion, and it's every two years, and all the pioneers come back. And, um, and so I was selected as an astronaut on August 24th, 1998, and on August 27th, 1998, three days later, we had the astronaut reunion, and I was seated that night at dinner next to Neil Armstrong and, uh, and, uh, and some, some other pioneers at the table, at my table, and I was just frozen, you know? <laughs> and, it, 
and it, as I'm sitting next to Neil Armstrong, here's this little kid from upstate New York, you know, just an ordinary kid from an ordinary place. And I, I talked to him that day, and it was, it was that day, it took me getting into NASA to figure all this out that what I said to, oh, I said, what am I going to ask Neil Armstrong? And it's like, you know, and what I really wanted to know was like, you know, I, I, I didn't want to ask him, you know, hey, tell me about the, you know, the M2 space modulator on the, you know, whatever. But uh, so what I wanted to know is how he felt because I couldn't, I didn't know what that was like as an ordinary kid because this is a world beyond what I could ever dream uh, to be a part of. And so I asked him, I said, Mr. Armstrong, when you were standing on the moon, did you have a couple of minutes just to kind of look back at the Earth and think, wow, you know, what an amazing point in human history where we're standing on the moon looking back at the Earth. And he goes, you know, the first thing that came to my mind is, how does an ordinary kid from Wapakoneta, Ohio, end up standing on the moon? And I, I was like in shock, and I'm thinking like, that's my story, you know? <laughs> it really is. And the first thing I want you to take out of here is like, that's all of our story. We're just ordinary kids from ordinary places with really, really big dreams. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about my journey, show you some cool photos and stuff, and then I'm gonna open up to questions because what I want you to take from here is to always be curious. Number one is to be curious, okay? Curiosity. We're gonna talk a little bit about those crazy guys over in Kitty Hawk here in just a minute. And then I want you to think about perspective, perspective in your own life. Because sometimes we have dreams and we have goals. Uh, they're difficult to reach. Uh, we're afraid. There's a lot of fear that creeps into our life. One thing that I, that I noticed right away at NASA is why NASA is so, because I was like, how am I ever going to get there? How am I ever going to be able to have strong enough knees and a strong enough spine to fly to Mars or fly to the moon and stand up and, uh, and, and do my work? Because the, the fear that, of the unknown kind of creeps in. So what we do from day one at NASA is we train failure. It's like, wow, that doesn't, I thought failure was not an option at NASA. And it's, failure is, is replete in our, of, in our options. And we practice failure because we want to know what it feels like to fail. Because when you think of the word failure, especially like on an exam or something like that, we're all afraid of that. And so, so all of, the bulk of our work at NASA when we're astronauts and we're standing firmly on the ground is to practice the management of fear. And we do that through preparation. Now, let me show you a couple of, uh, couple of photos here. That's my first flight. That's my... <laughs> Can you bring down these lights just a little bit? Just a little bit. Um, yeah, so that's the first flight. That happened not too far from here. Kitty, anybody ever, ever been to Kitty Hawk? You guys been over there? Okay, lots of people. I love coming to North Carolina. Thank you for having me. Because North Carolina, what I love about North Carolina is on, on your, who knows of the children, on your license plate on the cars, what's it say about North Carolina? First in flight, right? First in flight, because it happened here, the first flight. Well, the folks up in Ohio, because these crazy guys, <laughs> These crazy guys, now my wife is from Ohio, and so she said, hey, wait a second, you're going to North Carolina? I said, well, the, plate, the license plates in Ohio, anybody know what they say on those plates? Birthplace. birthplace of aviation, that's right. Birthplace of flight, birthplace of aviation. Because they're claiming the Wright brothers as their own, which they didn't do way back when, because these guys were two crazy guys. They said, like, one day, I have this dream that one day we're gonna fly like birds. And people thought they were crazy. Now, the Wright brothers knew nothing about, they had no formal education. They were inventors, and they had a bicycle shop, right? You, you guys know the story in Dayton, Ohio, they had a bicycle shop. And um, they, they wrote to the Smithsonian trying to get, uh, you know, you probably have seen these old films of people trying to fly. You know, they had machines that kind of bounced up in the air, and people actually strapped wings to their arms, and they jumped off of high places. That didn't work out so well. You know, we. <laughs> We tried and tried to fly, and, one, and uh, Wilbur Wright stood up and he said, like, one day we're going to fly like birds. And they said, you are crazy. Now, it was December of, of, of that year, and so it was a little cold in Ohio, so they came to North Carolina, 
And uh, of course, you guys just got this big snow as well that came through, right? So, and the, who knows how long this first flight was? 12 seconds, that's right. 12 seconds. And you're thinking like, wow, that was, that's kind of, kind of, uh, you know, what's the big deal? 12 seconds. I mean, he, but the first flight was 12 seconds. Only went about 120 feet, 130 feet, something like that. But 12 seconds that changed the world. And these guys were, were kind of my, I read about the Wright brothers. And, you know, on that day, that day on the beach, there were five people there. Wilbur and Orville Wright and three others. And one of the other people that was there, his one job was to take a photo. And he took this photo. And his name is John Daniels. And it was 12 seconds. And it, when he, it was his turn to, uh, to take the photo. The plane took off and he said he was just frozen because he, he could not believe what he was seeing. Now, how long can you stay frozen for before you capture this, this photo? But he captured this photo and years later, he talked about how, you know, it just opened up the minds of, of all those around, around at the time and how we, we took to the skies and flew. Get the volume here. Roger the pitch. Seven. Five. Roger, Roger. Right You're looking good. Three. Two. We are the explorers. We have a need to find what is out there. It is a drive inside each and every one of us. The drive to wonder, to push the boundaries, and to explore. We expanded across our lands, settling new frontiers. We took to the oceans and learned that we could cross treacherous expanses in the pursuit of discovery. And then we took to the skies and flew. But that wasn't enough. We left the planet and redefined what was possible. We flew in space. We walked in space. What once was a melodramatic flight of fantasy became reality. Then, a new generation of spaceships captured hearts and minds for three decades and helped build a castle in the sky that is our lasting home in space. We have always looked up for centuries, we wondered what was on the other side of the sky, and we have begun to answer that question. We have learned that all the exploration humankind has achieved is only a beginning. Right now, men and women are working on the next steps to go farther than we have ever gone before. New vessels will carry us, and new destinations await us. Everything we have ever accomplished leads to this moment in time where exploration will now take us to the planets and the stars. Our nearest neighbors in the night sky have beckoned us, invited us, dared us to reach for them. We are the explorers. Throughout our history, we have taken both small steps and giant leaps in that pursuit. Our next destination awaits. We don't know what new discoveries lie ahead, but this is the very reason we must go. The curiosity that could carry us to our dreams. When I was just a, there we go. When I first got to space, I launched on the space shuttle Discovery way back in 2007, 11 years ago. And, um, and this was the view when I first looked out the window and I thought, how amazing our world. Uh, but the things that I noticed right away, uh, of course, the, that our planet is made up of mostly water. And, and in fact, a lot of the times when we look out the window, out the windows, it's all we could see is the oceans, you know, very, very small landforms in, in comparison to the oceans. But the thing I noticed right away is this thin blue line. You see this thin blue line? That's our atmosphere. That's what protects us from the harmful radiation from the sun, from cosmic radiation. And uh, that's, our, that's the only thing that makes us different than the other planets. And the very next breath for all of us is in that thin blue line. So it's very, very striking when you first get to space. 
And, and the earth is like an explosion of color in this vast empty sea of darkness. You know, here on earth we say like, you know, it's a beautiful day if the, sky, the sun is shining and the sky is blue. Well, on, in space, the sun is always shining and the sky is just jet, jet black. You can see this, this, the darkness. So the, our, our planet is like an explosion of color in this vast empty sea of darkness. Anybody recognize that feature? We're kind of a little bit... Now in space, we have no gravity, so we're floating around. So the orientation here, those are the Great Lakes. Uh, we're kind of looking southwest, though, so you can see here's uh, Lake Michigan and Lake Huron, right? Down to uh, Lake Erie, the Niagara River, Niagara Falls in here, and then Lake Ontario. Really, really cool perspective of, of, uh, of our planet from space and how fragile we are in the cosmos. And then you look out toward the moon and you kind of get the glow of the earth and you can see that our, our earth is in the, in the vast expanse of, the, of our solar system and the universe is like this glowing ball of life. Anybody recognize those features? Yeah, that, that's right, that's the Soyuz, our Soyuz uh, capsules. Uh, those are our lifeboats on board the space station. Um, you can see the thin blue line again here. Um, this is actually Lake Ontario. So this is upstate New York, my home. Uh, this is Cape Cod, if you recognize here, in the, the city of Boston down here. Uh, Long Island, I met somebody from Long Island uh, this morning. And um, this is New York City, of course, here. And then you might recognize this place. Looking west, that's right. Looking west, that's the coast of North Carolina. So you can see... You can see the Chesapeake here, right? The Chesapeake coming down the Carolina coast. You got Hatteras uh, down to Cape Fear, and the city. We're sitting right in here somewhere, right? So, right about in there. So, I think right, maybe right in here. But there's that thin blue line again. And you, when you th when you think about it, we have what we call the overview expect, uh, perspective. And what I wanted to talk to you about, the curiosity of the Wright brothers and those early explorers, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about perspective as well. And um, anybody recognize this feature? Kind of like a nondescript, uh, it looks like you got desert here, but we're right in the middle of some pyramids. Those are the pyramids in Egypt. You can see them there from space. And so the Nile River running through here. And so, you know, we, we always kid that, that we have no borders in, in space, or we can't see borders between states and, and countries, but we can certainly see where the borders are, where the water is. And that's a lot of our science that we're doing on the space station, is to help us better understand our water resources and how to better use our water resources as well. And this will give you a better image of that, a better contrast. You can still, again, see that thin blue line. And then down here, it looks like a stink. This is the Nile River running through the Sahara Desert. So you can see the stark differences between where the water is and where, and that's where we live. You know, so we're drawn to the water sources, of course. Anybody recognize that place? That's, that, that's right, I heard somebody say Mount Everest is right there. So this is really zoomed in, a 1200 millimeter lens actually, big lens, and we zoomed in to catch the, uh, catch the shadow coming off of Everest in Nepal our tallest mountain on earth. It looks like an impressionist painting, yeah? But this is the great, a part of the Great Barrier Reef off the coast of uh, Australia. So you can see the, we, a lot of our studies, a lot of our science is studying our oceans as well. Uh, we study our landforms, our oceans, our coastlines, and uh, to help us better understand uh, what's happening with our coral reefs and things. Anybody from Britain? The UK folks out there. This is, uh, this is the island of Great Britain. We're kind of looking west here, so there's, there's our atmosphere again. This is our Soyuz here, our lifeboat on board the space station. Um, this is Great Britain. London's down here under the fog. And, uh, and, uh, yeah. and um, Scotland up here, of course, in Ireland. Now, anybody recognize that place? Big island nation. 
Yeah, Madagascar. That's right. I heard somebody say Madagascar. That's the island of Madagascar, not the movie. But one of the, <laughs> one of the cool pieces of science uh, that I was working on on the space station when I was up there, I was up there in 2010. I got a chance to go up on the Russian uh, spaceship, uh, Soyuz spaceship. And I was the commander of the, of the International Space Station in the summer of 2010. And we had a science experiment because the island of Madagascar, this is a picture I took in 2010, uh, because we were helping scientists understand how we can reforest Madagascar. And so in the middle part of the island, they had chopped down all the trees. And so from space, you know, here on Earth, we, we pretty much live our lives in, in two dimensions. And so we talk about we talk about when we're cutting down forests and things, but from space you can actually see the effects of that. So you could see how we cut down the forest. Here we could see a couple of fires here too where they're burning off uh, some of the underbrush as well. And then you could see along the coastline all the mud. See all the mud there? And, and the mud choking the rivers on the island as well because all of this good rich topsoil in the middle part of the island is washing away. And so now it, it doesn't have enough biomass bio in, in it uh, to create uh, a, an existence for good, good enough for trees to grow and to replant. So what we were looking at in space is willow trees. We had little tiny willow trees in space. And here I am, you know, the, an engineer and a test pilot, and I've got, I'm working with these tiny little willow trees. And we had, we had a light source and we had a water source. And so when we took gravity out of the equation, we wanted to see, and our scientists wanted to look at, what happens to the root system in these trees when there's no gravity. So normally a tree has a tap root, right? It dri drives a tap root down and then has other secondary roots for support. And so scientists were wondering, does that tap root go down because that's where the water is? Or does it go down because gravity is pulling it down? Uh, or both, or maybe a combination of the two. So when we take gravity out of that equation, does the root system, is there something in the genome of the tree that actually can sense where the water is? And so we moved the water source around and could watch the roots turn toward the water source in the absence of any kind of soil. And uh, same with the light as well. And so we were helping scientists be able to, to engineer trees to get some biomass back into the soil and be able to, for it to withstand and sustain a, a forest, reforestation. Then the light goes down, right? So, some, so we're orbiting the Earth once every 90 minutes, and so we're traveling at 17,500 miles per hour. So, um, you know, we're, pick your favorite city. If you, anybody know, visit people in Charlotte. Charlotte's about a, is about a three hour drive, something like that. Four hour drive, something like that. So you could probably get there in a spaceship in about 10 seconds, probably. So we're traveling pretty fast. Pretty fast, and, and so we're, that we're orbiting the Earth once every 90 minutes. We get a sunrise or a sunset every 45 minutes. So every day we get 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets, and every one of them uniquely beautiful. And when I was outside on my first spacewalk, I was very distracted by, by the colors of the Earth, and so I went out, I was kind of like mesmerized with the, it's like, wow, the Earth is so beautiful, I could see the the coastlines and some mountains, mountain ranges and rivers and things. And um, I thought, gosh, I, I wasn't getting any of my work done. I said, I can't wait for the sun to set so I, can, so I can concentrate on my work and not be distracted by that big, blue, beautiful planet below me, you know. And then the sun goes into eclipse and we're on the backside of the Earth and the Earth comes alive with light and motion. And so this is the aurora and um, it's just amazing. I'm gonna show you a little movie here and uh, when you look at the images on here, it's, uh, we, we took some images on kind of, a lot of it's fast forwarded, but uh, you can see lightning strikes. It looks like flash bulbs going off on, uh, on cameras or something. So you see that on the earth and there's, there's storms on, on, the surf on the surface of the earth as well that we can see from space. Volume up.
lightning strikes there. So the Earth at night is just amazing. It's a, this, our, the lights of our cities and roads are like a mosaic of light. And so you probably recognize that place. Yeah, it's pretty easy to recognize. It's a, it's a peninsula of Florida all the way down, actually all the way down to Key West down here. See that? And here's, of course, Miami area, the greater Miami area over here in Tampa. And on up, you can see Atlanta in here as well. And actually, you could probably see the dim lights of Raleigh up there as well, so up the coast. But the earth, is not, the earth at night, I mean, it just comes alive with color and light of the aurora and the mosaic light of our cities. Um, this is, um, this of course, the, is the boot of Italy, right? So I heard somebody say, that's the boot. So that's the, the boot of Italy. So we're kind of looking, uh, the perspective, we're kind of looking east. And um, this is Rome up underneath the fog again here as well. Um, this is the city of Naples here, the Naples area. And do um, you notice that little, there's a circular dark spot there where there are no lights. Anybody want to guess where that is? That's right, that's right. It's, a, it's actually, that dark spot is, the, is Mount Vesuvius. And that's the volcano that erupted that buried the ancient city of Pompeii. So I heard someone say Pompeii, and that's, that was right down in here. It was a port city, and now it's buried. And so you can see... You can see we don't build on the volcano, but gosh, we're awful close to the volcano. I don't, I don't know if I'd want to be living there, but, uh, but the, the earth at night is just amazing. Again, uh, for uh, folks that have done a little bit of travel in Europe, um, these are our solar rays, of course, that provide all of our energy, uh, electrical uh, power for the uh, space station. This is the city of London, and so here's the, uh, the, the Straits of Dover. And, uh, of course, Paris down here and all the cities of, of Western Europe here as well. Now, you may recognize this place. Uh, so this is, uh, this is Long Island. And this is New York City, of course. Uh, the, coming down to Philadelphia, you can see, uh, what is that, I-95 or something coming down to Philly? And uh, down to Baltimore, Washington on down to Richmond, down to Norfolk, and I think Raleigh's like right over in here, I think, just behind, just behind the Soyuz, I think. And up here, you can still see the Great Lakes. You can see Ontario, and here's, uh, this is Ottawa, and Toronto, uh, Buffalo, Niagara Falls here, Cleveland, Detroit, Chicago is the glow underneath the uh, solar array. So we can see, we can see a, a good distance, and you can, you can really help with, uh, a lot of our science is the, the study of weather patterns, the study of coastlines, uh, the study of our forests, and, uh, better, and better use of, uh, of farmland for watering and things like that. So, 
Now, here's that, uh, here's that perspective again with the Nile River. So at night, it's just amazing uh, the stark difference. You can see the darkness of the... Now, there are some lights out here in the Sahara Desert, and I'm, I'm guessing that's probably an area where there's an oasis, maybe. And, um, of course, all the lights that we see are all along the River Nile, all up to uh, Alexandria and uh, Cairo up here. Um, this is the island of Cyprus. Over here is uh, Athens all the way around the Holy Land here, uh, uh, Jerusalem and uh, Tel Aviv here, and uh, on down to the, the Sinai Peninsula here as well. And then looking into the stars, you know, a lot of times when you see pictures of uh, the astronauts send back, the stars might be washed out if they're trying to get something up close. And so when they take a picture and it's dark, it's just because of the, the intensity of the light like bouncing off of the Earth uh, will drown out those, uh, those stars, will actually bleach them out. So, so the, um, at night, as we get these great images of the Milky Way, of course, um, right here, and, uh, and just the, the star patterns. I, I took this picture. And um, I was so proud of myself. And the, the second thing I wanted to talk to you about is perspective. Because uh, for the kids, the first thing to remember is curiosities. So just think of the Wright brothers. They were really curious. People thought they were crazy. But their curiosity carried, ended up carrying us to the stars. And so to always be curious. So the kids out there, don't be afraid to ask those questions. Always be curious about the world around you. Ask questions. Um, second thing I wanted to hit uh, with you guys to leave with is perspective and perspective in your own life, perspective, perspective of your goals and your dreams and the things that you're reaching for and the things that you're afraid of on that journey as well. And um, this is actually the Iberian Peninsula, so this is like Spain, Portugal area, uh, but right in here is Orion rising, so you can see Orion and I'm, not a, I'm a very, very basic astronomer and um, I'm an engineer and a test pilot. So when I thought, oh gosh, I got a picture of Orion, I'm gonna send it back to our astronomers at NASA. And they said, well, that's really cute. Here's our, here's our. <laughs> they sent me this up and this was taken not, from, not by me, from one of my cameras, but the, this is, of course is Orion. And we, it's very easy to recognize for us because it's got the, you know, it's got the three, it's got the three stars in the belt here. And of course these corner stars anchoring and Betelgeuse is kind of up here doing its own thing. And, um, but the, the astronomer and engineer at NASA that sent this to me, I was on board the station. I was kind of in the waning months of my stay. I stayed up there for six months and uh, really beginning to miss home. You know, before I flew in space, my, uh, my favorite planet was Mars, actually, actually Pluto. And then they, you know, <laughs> who thinks Pluto should still be a planet? Yeah. Me too. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you. Neil deGrasse Tyson doesn't, uh, doesn't think so. The, but, um, uh, but Pluto was my favorite, and Pluto is so cool. And did you see those images from last summer when we had our mission go by Pluto, and that was just amazing. And, um, and so then it was Mars, you know, because I thought maybe one day I'll get a chance to go to Mars. And it, we're going to be watching a person step foot on Mars probably in about 20 to 25 years. And our astronauts, we usually pick them when they're in the early to mid-30s. And so that means for us at NASA and for all of us in this room, those future Mars walkers are somewhere among us. And so they're, they're probably our kids in elementary school now, up into middle school, those first Mars walkers are somewhere in our classrooms and maybe even in this room, which is really cool for us at NASA. And, we, and to have that perspective, you need to, I, I wanted to, show you this little lesson that this astronomer taught me, because he sent me this image. He said, here's a really cool um, image of Orion. He said, and uh, uh, as, your, as your good night uh, message, uh, good night from planet Earth, uh, did you know that of these seven stars, so this one, this one, this one, this one, and the three in the belt, of those seven primary stars of the constellation Orion, three of those stars are actually closer to Earth than they are to each other. I just let that, adults let that sit in for, for a minute so you can help your children understand perspective in their own life. Because a lot of times we, I mean, we walk the earth in two dimension, don't we? I mean, we, if we were to come in this room and have a sleepover tonight, it's like, no way, it's like not enough room, right? 
So even if you brought a sleeping bag and a pillow, it's like there's not enough room in here because we never look up because we can't sleep up there. But if you're on the space station, you can. So all of a sudden, if you turn off gravity and let your mind open up your mind to a deeper perspective for your own goals and dreams. And this is what we try to tell our scientists. It's like you do your science. All of our science that we do, we live our lives in two dimension. When you pour water out on the, on the ground, it flattens out into a puddle. It's really got two dimensions. We don't ever really think about you know, the, the depth of it unless you're driving a car and just, the road is covered with water or something. But, but it really kind of squishes down into two dimensions. And we go left or right uh, and, and forward or back. And that's really all we could do because we can get in an airplane and go up but we don't ever think about that as useful space. And so in our thought process too, in science as well, in our thought process, when we think about our dreams as well, because we, we look at that, we look at Orion and it's two dimensional to us. We, we, we could see the stars and we, we just envision them all being out there as a family, right? So, but the reality is some of them are closer to us than they are to each other. And so the perspective in your own life is to, and to help our children see the depth, a little more depth in their life, that they are ordinary kids, but we're all just ordinary kids, and to nurture that curiosity in them so they can get a deeper perspective of their own existence. Now, one of the things, you know, flying on the space station, so we have a potty on the space station, right? So, so the, and the potty is very important on the space station. And so I'm an engineer and a scientist, and I was up there with two very, very smart women, PhD scientists, and um, I'm, I'm a test pilot, engineer, and uh, not a scientist, but I had science I had to do, and the potty broke. And sh so Shannon, my crewmate, came to me. She said, hey, the potty's broken. And I'm thinking, like, well, we need to fix the potty. I mean, come on. And so I don't want to be trapped on this spaceship with a, you know, without the potty working. And so she said, if you fix the potty, I'll do all of your science. I thought, <laughs> okay, that's a deal. So we slept five. We slept five, and uh, it took me about an hour and a half, but I did the dumpster dive behind the potty, and I got it fixed, uh, as good engineers do. And, I, and I, um, I realized after about a week of being in space that if, if you can fix the potty on a spaceship, you're like guardian of the galaxy, you know? So, <laughs> you're like the guy. So a couple of years ago, you may have heard, we had two guys out on a spacewalk, an Italian astronaut and a US astronaut, and one of them got water in his helmet. Do you remember this? So water in the helmet, and you're thinking like, what's the big deal, water in the helmet? Because water reacts quite differently here on Earth. It acts in two dimension because we all act in two dimension here on Earth. But in space, when you take gravity out of the equation, so now we have five liters of water in this suit that we wear, this big space suit that we wear. It's used to cool the electronics in the suit and to cool our body as well. And um, so we have this water flowing through. All of a sudden, it started coming into his helmet. And, it, it, and water in space, I'm going to show this little video. Water in space is like slime. It's like it's got such high surface tension that it kind of gloms together in a ball. And um, it sticks to everything. And so it was kind of coming across his head like an amoeba, you know, <laughs> kind of kind of coming like an alien coming across and wiped out his mic booms. And so he couldn't talk. He couldn't hear. And the water was coming, engulfing his head, and his helmet almost filled up with water, and he almost drowned in space. And we thought, like, oh my word, we never thought of that, right? So, so now, now we we take countermeasures, like, gosh, we never thought of that failure. So now we practice that all the time in our in our spacesuits, how to deal with water escaping into your helmet. But we put together this is our first uh, scientific study, the volume. So we did a little scientific study on the space station first. So you can see, this is what happens to water. It kind of, it's got such high surface tension. It, and it's very, the surface tension is so high that it, you ever see, look out on your pool or on a pond or something, and all these little insects that are walking across the water, it's like, how can that be? You know, it's, it's because the surface tension is so high. But it's also like glue, it kind of, here we put a GoPro into the, uh, into the ball of water. And now you can see these little worlds inside the world as well. And this is, this is really kind of the, it's 
just all fun and games here on the space station. Super astronaut tricks, we call them. But, um, but it's really the basis of our science in space as well. We take gravity out of the equation and crazy, cool, unusual things happen that we can, can help us uh, determine more about uh, life on Earth. So you can see it's kind of grabbing onto, grabbing onto his hand like almost like slime on Nickelodeon or something, right? So, so um, and then we're gonna take, we're gonna take that ball now, just like, just like with the planets, Big planets, little planets, when you have a large mass, a very, very strong surface tension, uh, sometimes when they're equal size, they actually meet together and they kind of, they conjoin together. Now, if one is larger or smaller than the other, it's quite a bit different. So now Reed's gonna show us here how he's gonna make a big ball. And you can see how these tinier ones, that surface tension is so strong that they just bounce off of that because of the mass difference and the surface tension, strength of the surface tension. This is real garage science right here on the space station. And Reed's gonna put a little world inside the world and we can study. And now we do a, a little test on, uh, on force moment, you know, so you can see when you, when you got this little world inside that world, so now you can you can plaster the side of it with, with the jet stream. You can see how the how the vibration carries inside of the water as well. And then we had Alex demonstrate what it'd be like to get what it's like to get water in your helmet. And so this is kind of what happens. And you can see it's kind of like jello, like a real and it really kind of just like I think this next one's from the you can see it come over his head like a like an alien. Anyway, stupid astronaut tricks, yeah. I always wanted to be able to juggle when I was a kid. I, I, I still never got the hang of it, but um, uh, we get fresh fruit in space, which is cool. It's my favorite uh, part of uh, the food uh, source up there when we got fresh fruit. And uh, so that would come up on resupply vehicles, and most of our, fruit, our food is uh, freeze-dried, so it's not very tasty, but uh, that's me in space, juggling. Here's uh, Shannon and I. So Shannon is the one that uh, reported the broken potty, and so uh, she did all of my science that day, but um, you can see how everything's just kind of floating around. These are cans of food, and, and uh, here's it. We got a knife, our scissors getting away there as well, so you have to be very careful inside the spaceship. Sleeping in space is very, very comfortable, but it's a little creepy if you, get, if you have to get up to use the potty or something. And I did one night, I, uh, so this is the mid-deck of the Space Shuttle Discovery. And so, whoops, let me go back. Can you start that back, go to that, that there you go. Well, let's see. I messed that up. Okay, well, so the, uh, the um, yeah, there we go, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Perfect, thank you. That's Ad uh, Aben up there, thank you Aben. Let's give him a ring round. <laughs> thank you buddy, appreciate it. So sleeping in space, it's kind of creepy, right? So, the, so it's uh, the bathroom of the space shuttle, let me see if I can do this without kicking the slides off. So the bathroom of the, on the space shuttle is right back here. There's a little door there, and you kind of go around that corner, and the potty's right there. And I had to go to the bathroom. I was sleeping on the ceiling that night. And, um, <laughs> and I got up to use the potty, and I saw my crewmates uh, here. And you're, you kind of go, the, your body goes like into a fetal position, so your arms start floating. It looks like a Stephen King movie or something like that. So, <laughs> so sleeping in space. And the last thing I wanted to leave you with, as we, we open it up for questions now, um, so we talked about curiosity and finding perspective in your own life, depth uh, for your goals and dreams as well, and then the, the preparation part of it. When I first started learning to fly, I remember I, I started out in helicopters. Anybody, any helicopter pilots out there? So, any, no helicopter pilots? 
Okay, so learning to fly a helicopter is pretty tricky. I mean, it's your feet, your, your hands, your arms, your, 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 your body's kind of wiggling around trying to keep things straight. And um, I remember my first, very first flight instructor, this is at Fort Rucker, Alabama. Anybody been down there? Fort Rucker, Alabama is a home of Army aviation. And so I was in Army aviation. And so this guy, his name was Steve Millard, and he was teaching me how to fly a helicopter. And he, he sat on the, on the right side of the helicopter with his foot up, we had the doors off, you know, his foot up in the, in the door and he's, and he goes, okay, he, he's hovering with one finger on the cyclic, he's just kind of doing like this, we're at a dead hover, you know. And he goes, okay, you have the controls. And I said, I have the controls. And so I took the controls and he took his hands off and I started kind of doing like this, you know. He looked over at me and he said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm trying to hover. And he goes, you do it just like this. And he, he puts his finger on there and again, that's how you hover, just like that. Okay, you have the controls. And so, and he said, you know, when the engine quits, where are you going to go? You know, did, did you know that chance favors the prepared mind? So the last thing I wanted to talk to you about, especially the children and those with you that have influence with children, is preparation. Preparation is the key. So chance favors the prepared mind is what he kept telling me. And I was like, what are you talking about? You know, chance favors the prepared mind. We started flying up and away and he goes, you know, you got one engine in here. Uh, what are you going to do when the engine quits? And I was like, I don't know. I, I, mean, I can auto rotate in a, in, a, in a helicopter so I can. So he got me looking at fields, empty fields. I could probably land in that field. And so every day we flew, where are you going to go when the engine quits? You know, chance favors the prepared mind. You got to be prepared. Everything you're doing, you got to be thinking about and preparing for failure. You got to be. You got to know what failure feels like. You got to know what it looks like, and so that way you can react to it. So when the failure comes, you know how to react, and that's how we do all of our business at NASA. So one day we were flying along, and he said, "So where are you going to go when the engine quits?" And I said, "Well, I'll probably go." And he rolled the engine off, and so. He, and so just from rote, you know, his words were f flying through my mind. I just literally, without even thinking, I put that helicopter safely down in that field and then had like a, a moment of uh, like euphoria at the end. It's like, what did I just do? It's like he, he said, chance favors the prepared mind. And I thought, I'm never going to forget that lesson. You know, it was years later, as in 2009, actually, you might remember the miracle on the Hudson, right? So... The uh, Captain Sully Sullenberger put that airplane down on the Hudson River, uh, just, a, just right adjacent to New York City. And he took off, he came down and talked to us at NASA. And we, we talked a little bit about preparation and how chance favors the prepared. And um, he said, gosh, big time, he said, he said I remember uh, coming up out of there. He flew out of uh, LaGuardia there, and both engines flamed out. And so he had no engines, very heavy jet too, loaded with people, loaded with fuel, and he didn't have enough, enough uh, gas to turn around, or enough altitude to get back to LaGuardia. So the controllers were like, you could turn immediately, do a 180 and just come back to LaGuardia. He goes, I'm too low, I, can't, I don't have the space. And uh, so the, you could hear the controllers on, the, on that uh, transmission to Captain Sullenberger. They said, well, Teterboro Airport in Teterboro, New Jersey is about seven miles off your, off your nose. He goes, I'm not gonna make Teterboro. And, um, and so they said, well, can you, can you put it down over here? There's a, they're lining up maybe like a, a long stretch of highway or something. And he said, I'm going to put it in the river. And, um, and there was silence. <laughs> and, the, and the controllers say, like, say again, you know? And, uh, and another pilot came over the air and he said, I think he's going to put it in the Hudson. And he put it down in the river and everyone survived. We remember that story, right? I mean, it's now eight years ago, eight or nine years ago. And, um, but Captain Sellerberger said, he goes, you know, I remember back in my initial pilot training, it's like, when the engine quits, where are you gonna land, you know? I thought, man, that's the same story for me too. And he said that chance favors the prepared mind. So preparation for our children, so curiosity, perspective on your own goals and dreams, and, uh, and preparation to reach those goals and dreams as well. So let's open it up to questions. Do you guys have any questions about anything? Life, living, working in space. And I think we have microphones coming as well. Okay, right here. Now come to this little one here. So. What did you guys do on the plane when you were bored and you had nothing to do? 
Okay, uh, so boredom in space. So I, I was kind of concerned about that because I was going to live there for six months. And so I thought, am I going to be bored in space? And um, I was never bored. You know, they, they say that space, uh, one day in space, it's kind of like over the, over the stretch of six months, one 24-hour one day is like 23 hours and 45 minutes of kind of like routine science, you know, hygiene, uh, storage of, uh, and packing of materials and things like that, followed by 15 minutes of sheer terror. And that's, that's about what it is in the space station, that uh, there's always something that's, uh, that needs fixing or needs attention. And, um, and if, you ever get, if you ever have the twinge of feeling bored, you go immediately to the windows and take pictures and things. So uh, we had ways to communicate with our families as well. Uh, we had movies on board. Uh, we had every Friday night was movie night. And so we, op we operate the space station on Greenwich Mean Time. So Greenwich, England, the prime meridian, is, uh, is how we operate. The crew gets up at 6 o'clock in the morning, Greenwich, and then goes to bed at 9.30 in the evening, Greenwich. And we try to give them the weekends off as well. And we, do, we run it like a regular laboratory. So Friday night was, uh, was movie night. And so uh, we could have, probably around Wednesday, we'd have somebody pick out a movie for Friday. And so we'd watch movie t movies together and, uh, and uh, write email to family. Uh, some people wrote uh, short stories and, and things like that, uh, sang music. We have a guitar and a keyboard and a flute on board the uh, space station as well. Let's go over here. How do you like make sure you don't drift off into space? How do you make sure you don't drift off into space? That's a very good question because when you're outside on a spacewalk, it can be pretty scary. And so we try to have tethers. You know, we try to we have tethers with hooks on them. And so we we inch along and when we get somewhere where we're gonna work, we hang on, first of all. We try not to let go until we have a tether down and we'll put a hook on this, like a handle on the outside of the space station. Once that hook's down, then you can just let go. So now, if, if for some reason we forget to put the hook down, which would be bad, um, we have a little jet pack. It's called a safer and we, if you get floating away from the space station, you can reach down and pull this handle and this little controller comes out and you, you take this controller and you click it to the front of your suit, it has Velcro on it, and you start flying back to the space station like this with a little joystick. It's like flying a video game. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We try not to do that, though, because it's only for emergencies. So we try to stay tethered. So, But that would be really bad if we went floating off in space. That would not be a good day. OK, how about like right here in the middle? Has anything hit the space station before? Has anything hit the space station? That's a very good question. Did you see the movie Gravity? When all that? <laughs> that was not filmed in space, by the way. But the movie Gravity, a lot of things were hitting the space station. We do have concerns about um, not only like old rocket pieces of rockets and things. There's a lot of space junk. You may have heard stories about the space junk that's up there. And there, there is a lot of uh, particle. There are a lot of particles that are floating around. Some of them big, some of them small. We try to track anything that's bigger than a couple of inches. We can actually see it with, uh, with uh, our sensing devices, and we can tell where it is. And so we warn the crew. Or if we see like a asteroid coming or something, you know, or some sort of space debris, we, when we see it coming toward the space station, uh, we have a what's called a debris avoidance maneuver. And so we can actually move the space station. We could change its attitude, you know, which is kind of like, like in an airplane, you t tilt the wings like that. We can, we can raise and lower its orbit so this little uh, thing that's flying by doesn't intersect us. But every day, all day, we're being pelted by little particles that are coming from deep space. And so it's actually so, most of them smaller than a grain of sand. But we have shielding on the outside of the space station to protect us. And we've never had a piece of this come through into the space station, opening up a hole in the hull of the space station. But you can, when you take away a rack and you put your ear against the hull of the spaceship, you can actually hear the, the little particles hitting the space station. So 
It's kind of scary, actually, when you think about it. So. That's a very good question, though. We, and we hope the big part doesn't hit us, you know. If it's big and we can see it, um, and, and if it looks like it's going to hit, we actually send our, send our astronauts to their Soyuz uh, vehicles. Those are those big modules that we're sticking in some of the pi pictures. Those are our lifeboats as well. And so we get inside of there and we get ready to come home if we need to. So, how about back here? And then we'll get the little guy across the Hey, uh, when you flew in the Soyuz spacecraft, can you uh, describe the reentry? <laughs> yes. Uh, so the reentry in the Soyuz is, um, it's like the best way to describe it, it's like going over Niagara Falls in a barrel and the barrel's on fire. So come back. <laughs> so, that's about what it feels like. And so um, it's very loud. And of course, now you're coming back in this little capsule and a uh, very tight squeeze in there. And um, and I had a window seat, so I had a window about right here, and um, you burn back through the atmosphere, and parts of your spaceship actually come apart. The part that you're in survives, but the other parts burn up, and they burn up like right outside your window. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a feast for the senses uh, coming back in, and it's, it's a rough ride, and, um, and we hit, and it was November. I landed on Thanksgiving Day in 2010, it was the end of November in, um, in, uh, in Kazakhstan. And we land on land. And uh, so there's high wind, there was snow. And we hit, we bounced, we hit again, then we rolled over. And so ha having been in space for six months with no gravity at all, having all this, uh, ex these accelerations and things was, was uh, quite an alarming uh, uh, experience for sure. So it gets very hot inside. Uh, very, very hot, and uh, it's an ablative surface, so as it heats up, it kind of sloughs off, and then sloughs off, it's getting thinner and thinner and thinner, and you're hoping the person that designed the thickness, you know, you know <laughs> was having a good day that day when they, <laughs> so. How about right here? And how are we doing on time, Bob, are we okay, or? Um, I think maybe two more questions. Okay, let's get, um, this little girl right here has been patient, right, uh, with the pink bow. With the pink bow, yeah. What does it look like in space? What does it look like? Did you see the pictures? Yeah. So the, 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 the Earth looks really, really cool. I mean, it's, we're pretty close to the Earth and the space station. So the Earth looks really big when you look out the window. But then you look the other directions, and there's nothing. It's just pure blackness. I mean, you can see the stars and everything, but it's, we're so... It made me feel very, very afraid that we, we are very, very fragile in space, I think, as a planet. And so it made me want to take better care of our planet, that's for sure. And uh, because it's a very, very special place, and I thought, um, and it looks like an explosion of color. Everything else is just dark and black and frightening. And um, when you look at the Earth, it's just like an explosion of color. It's really, really wonderful. Okay, how about... Um, Little, this little guy right here. He's, yeah, yes. <laughs> He's like, please pick me. On your first journey um, in 2007, when a quasar had a star quake and took half the atmosphere, did you go on the spaceship before or after? And when, if, if it was before, did it look any different than it did on your second journey? Wow. Uh, <laughs> I don't know the answer to your specific question, very specific question. Um, in 2007, I launched in October, though. I don't know the event you're talking about. If it, but let me tell you that, the, that solar events or any kind of cosmic event has impact on our planet as well. And we can see that. You know, with the like high solar activity, the aurora, those green, green and red lights, I mean, they're just like, it looks like, the Earth is encased in light. It's amazing to watch. And so, yes, uh, those celestial, uh, that celestial activity um, really impacts our atmosphere and the way that reacts with our atmosphere. And then those, you know, those bands that protect us from radiation, the, they're called the Van Allen belts. And so they're, it's, this, it's a sphere around the Earth that protects us from harmful radiation. And when light and energy gets trapped in those things as well, 
um, it, it really creates an amazing light show on Earth. So um, I can't specifically answer your question, but anything celestial, any, especially our star, you know, any, any of the other stars, but especially our star since we're so close to the sun, uh, when it has like bursts of energy, you can see it on the plan, uh, how it affects our planet as well. Very good question. Wow. That's awesome. Are you, what grade are you in? Uh, four. Fourth grade? Sweet. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Just an ordinary kid from an ordinary place, right? So it's going to change the world though. So thank you guys. I think. Um, yeah, thank so, you. So we'll do um, yeah. autographs for about 15 minutes. Um, yeah, I'm going to be outside and I'm going to be hanging around most of the day. So if you see me say like, hey, astronaut man, what about, just call me wheels. And I say, hey, wheels, what about this? I want to always know if I didn't get to your question. So uh, thank you very much. Appreciate it.